All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live instructors roundtable here on the 2022 ILET Summit. My name is Adam Kanakin. I'm the CEO and founder here of the ILET Network, and it is absolutely my honor and privilege to be back here with you again today. This is the third day in a row we've been able to run one of these live sessions, and uh, it just gets better each and every day. Obviously, day one, we did the active shooter. Day two, we did use of force. And today, today's something that we talk about every single year here at the ILET Summit, and that is mental health and wellness. And um, if you have ever been a part of an ILET event or you've seen any of the training that we do, there is always a component of mental health and wellness interleaved into there somewhere because it is so critical. If you're not squared away upstairs, it doesn't matter how good of a, a body you have and what kind of training you have, you're not going to be able to function optimally um, if you don't have everything in alignment and you're not taking care of yourself both um, physically, spiritually, and mentally. And so this is going to be a really great conversation here today on mental health and wellness. We have some amazing speakers um, and uh, panelists for you today. And we're doing a world exclusive um, where we're actually going to be showing the Wounded Blue documentary and uh, we'll get into that in a second. But before we get into everything, what I would like to do is give a shout out to our friends at Force Science. Force Science is the sponsor for today here at the ILET Summit. They're an absolutely amazing group of people when it comes to human factors research, training, and implementation of that training. Force Science is at the very tip of the spear. If you're not familiar with Force Science, go to forescience.com. Check them out today. They are absolutely amazing and you will not regret it. I promise you that. Additionally, the whole reason we're here with our I Got Your Six campaign this year is Blue Help. Blue Help is an amazing charitable organization in the United States. They are always the ones, they have the numbers when it comes to um, officer related suicide and injury as well. They help support officers and their families. And that's one of those things that gets left out a lot of the time is we always tend to hyper-focus on either an individual um, or on a problem. Blue Help really takes an all-encompassing approach to that support. It's not just the officer, but they look at their families, they look at their friends, and they help everyone. And that's why they are such an amazing organization. And that's why this year, when we run our I Got Your Six campaign, Absolutely every dollar that we bring in on the sale of our I Got Your Six shirts and patches is going to go to Blue Help to help support their mission and help them support our officers and our first responders in our communities. So huge thank you to them. Um, if you're not already signed up for the 2022 ILET Summit, you can go to iletsummit.com and you can register today. Uh, we're running live raffles. We're giving away over $10,000 worth of gear and training. Um, this week from all of our amazing sponsors and training partners. And um, obviously you'll have the ability to jump in and access and purchase some of those shirts. They are a limited run. So when they run out, they're gone. They never exist again. Um, so we do a, a different design each and every year and uh, it's really fun to do and it's for a great cause. So with that all being said, what I would like to do is bring on our panel and uh, let them introduce themselves. And then we're going to jump into the Wounded Blue documentary. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring you gentlemen in. Obviously, Pat uh, Pat is also here. Um, he'll be jumping in after the uh, the documentary. But um, I appreciate you guys being here. You are when when uh, we talk about mental health and resiliency and organizations that are really going above and beyond. Um, you guys are always at the forefront of those conversations, and uh, it is a complete honor to have you guys be here with me today and with everybody here. Um, on the summit. And what I'd like to do is just go around the horn real quickly, let you introduce yourself and uh, let people know who you are and, and where you're coming from. So uh, Steve, why don't we start with you, brother? You got it. Steve Huff. I'm the uh, chief operations officer with uh, First Help, which is incorporated with Blue Help. A uh, 25 year veteran of law enforcement. I retired recently in July this year and am now working full time with the uh, organization. That's awesome, brother. Well, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, you know, this is, uh, you and I had a lot of conversations. Actually, this started at Aelita uh, earlier in the yeah. year. And I said, hey, why aren't we doing stuff together? And uh, I think you were kind of surprised when I reached back out to you. And I was like, oh, hey, by the way, we're going to 
everything that we do this year is going to you guys. And you're like, oh, you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, guy comes out of nowhere um, yeah. and says, yeah, we're going to put you in front of hundred, uh, you know, tens of thousands of officers all around the world. Um, but I couldn't, it couldn't happen to a better group of folks. Um, you and all, uh, you know, um, also Karen and the entire team that you guys have there. Um, the work you do is amazing. So excited to Thank support you. Blue Help and, and First Help as well. Um, but that's a, another discussion for another day. You um, got it. Randy, who are you, brother? That's a great question. I've been trying to figure that out for years. But essentially, I'm Randy Sutton. I'm a retired Las Vegas police lieutenant. I did uh, 34 years of service, 10 in Princeton, New Jersey. And then I got kind of bored there and joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, where I wasn't bored. And along the way, I've done a few other things. Uh, if you ever saw the TV show Cops, I was on a bunch of those episodes, written some books, including A Cop's Life. And uh, But the most important thing that I've done um, as a result of uh, of an on-duty disabling uh, event was create the Wounded Blue. And the Wounded Blue is the national assistance and support organization for injured and disabled law enforcement officers, whether those injuries are physical or psychological and emotional. We've helped thousands and thousands of law enforcement officers across this nation. And I have an amazing team uh, that works with me and we're touching lives every day. That's awesome, brother. Um, I'm I'm so excited to be able to show this documentary as well. I mean, it's, me too. It's a, me too. It's an amazing piece of work. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, if you guys joined us yesterday, Jason Harney, uh, who was on the Use of Force panel, he was the same kind of guy who put this entire thing together um, with Randy uh, many moons ago. And um, you know, when when I talked to him about wrist lock, which is where he and I actually got connected, he was like, "Have you seen?" Wounded Blue, what we did a few years prior. And I said, no, what is this? And we started talking about it. And I said, well, shit, why do we not take an entire day out of this year's event and focus on it? Because, you know, it's one of those things where you guys put so much time and effort, blood, sweat, and tears into it. It's not fair that it days or a few, uh, even a year, and then it sits on a shelf. It's It was valuable then. It's valuable now and it'll be valuable 10 years from now. And so the more people we can get to see this message, I think we'll be better off. And so I'm excited to show that to the world, brother. And I appreciate you being here and being a part of it. No, I, and you know what? It's going to, even those of us who have served in law enforcement for as many years as most of us have, are going to be shocked by what they see in this documentary film. Yeah. No, absolutely. I know I was, I know when I looked, watched through it the first time, I was like, oh, okay, they went there. All right. That's good. <laughs> that's good. I love it. I love it. And uh, last but certainly not least, Mike. Yeah, my name is Michael Segru. I'm a former Air Force captain, security forces, and a retired police sergeant from the San Francisco Bay Area. I retired in 2018 medically for post-traumatic stress injury. And since then, I've been a national speaker and advocate for suicide prevention, officer wellness, and recently published a book a best-selling book with my co-author, Dr. Shauna Springer, and it's called Relentless Courage, Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma. Awesome. awesome. Well, and you're, do you're doing some amazing work with that book. I know uh, there's probably a lot of folks on here who will be like, I've seen that book. <laughs> or so, so, somebody shared a link somewhere with that book on it. So um, you're doing a great work, uh, great work getting that message out there as well, dude. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Mike, you and I got connected uh over it was probably three years ago now um when i started the the tactical breakdown podcast and you were one of our first guests and um we started sharing the message then and it's kind of come full circle now right it's just to a little bit of a bigger audience and so i uh, appreciate the fact that you could join me brother um like i said patrick fitzgibbons um is also here and uh, it looks like we finally got his stuff sorted out so we'll include him in the conversation um you may recognize him from our day one keynote um, earlier on the summit where he did his 50 minute conversation about, uh, his story and, uh, Pat, I'm just so, uh, so excited to have you here, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, and just a side note, StreamYard sucks. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody, anybody have any issues? No, I appreciate it, Adam. Uh, Pat Fitzgibbons, uh, I retired in 2019 from law enforcement after many years, um, went through some dark periods in my life, and now I'm a national spokesman for FHE Health and their Shatterproof program for first responders. Uh, I continue to get back to the 
brave men and women who serve us every day and need our help. Happy to be here and nice to meet all of you. Well, this is, um, and, and like I said, and, and uh, I don't know if anybody happened to watch my introduction um, on day one, um, but, uh, you know, the, the the truth of the matter is, is that we wouldn't all be here. Um, I let, as a summit wouldn't exist, I, the I let network wouldn't exist um, if it wasn't for that guy right there, Pat. Um, I remember, um, and uh, I, I think I've shared this with him before, I remember uh, vividly sitting in my car in a Walmart parking lot in the middle of winter up here in Canada and Manitoba. And, uh, I had, I'd reached out to him. I think it was via LinkedIn. And I said, Hey, I, I think of starting a podcast. And at the time CJ evolution was one of the top and still is one of the top podcasts in the law enforcement space. And I said, can I just pick your brain for a minute? And, uh, ever since then, uh, Pat, you've been so gracious with your time, um, and with your support and, uh, and truly dude, this, Everything that has come of this, every single person who's been a part of ILET is here because of uh, of the love and care and attention that you gave me um, many, many, many moons ago. So, brother, I, I can't say thank you enough for uh, for all the work that you do then and, and all the work you're doing now. And he just leaves because he's like, well, I've had enough. I've had <laughs> okay, so here's the, uh, as he gets his camera sorted out, what we're going to do here, folks, is obviously we're going to be showing the Wounded Blue, uh, we're going to be showing the Wounded Blue documentary. And um, Thank you, Adam. it'll be about 65, 70 minutes, I believe. Um, so strap in for that. But before we get into the video itself, Randy, it's, uh, it's, this is all about, this video is all about you, brother. So what I want to do is let you give you the floor and let you kind of lay some context down uh, for what the viewers here are about to watch. Sure. So the Wounded Blue, this, this film is called The Wounded Blue, Service, Sacrifice, Betrayed. And I know that's a very, those are some very powerful words, but, but uh, very germane to what is taking place when uh, law enforcement officers are injured or disabled in the line of duty. You know, <clears throat> this is a topic that very few people have really um, uh, truly understood. I mean, I was a 34-year police veteran. When I became disabled in the line of duty, I had no idea how I was going to be basically just um, just thrown away. And, and that's what officers are facing across this nation. Uh, depends on where you are. Uh, like if you're in New York City, you're going to get at least a decent pension and, and you're going to get your medical taken care of. But that's not the same in other states and in other cities around the country. So what the, the we created this, this film, Jason Harney who did this out of love. He certainly didn't do it for the money. Um, uh, very passionately understood the, the travails of our law enforcement uh, across the country. And so we spent a significant amount of time traveling the country, talking to officers who have experienced the trauma of, uh, of physical and psychological injury and their, their struggles. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we know that there's a tremendous suicide rate in law enforcement itself. What What is rarely talked about, if ever, is how that suicide rate exponentially increases when an officer is seriously injured in the line of duty. And, you know, probably Blue Help can talk about that because this is a topic that is rarely even discussed. So this this film um, was done at the when we when we first launched the Wounded Blue back in May of 2019. During that time, we've helped more than 13,000 police officers. So this is a significant uh, documentary film. I hope everybody enjoys it. I'd be happy to answer any questions afterward. And, uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity. All right. Well, with that being said, um, go and grab your popcorn and grab your drinks. <laughs> um, we're going to add this video in here. We're going to get this thing going. And... Um, Back, relax, and enjoy. Good. It was uh, October 26th of 2013. It was a traffic stop that I made. It happened to be um, a car full of uh, three gang members. As we get the stop initiated and, this, and the car kind of slow rolls for just a little bit, eventually stopping, 
I got out of the car and I, I, I kind of felt that there was a lot of uh, tension in the air. It's just that gut instinct that if you're, if you're a cop any amount of good time with some good experience on the road, you, you know that feeling where this feels like it could go south. I call for backup and during that time my thought process was to keep them talking. What are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm just coming from work. Where's work? Huh? Where's work? We just come from work. I know at this point that pretty much everything that's coming out of their mouth was uh, was just a bunch of uh, lying. And then there was at one point in the uh, during the stop where the driver actually leaned slightly. He leaned slightly to his right and he looks over just slightly at the front seat passenger and mumbled something to him in Spanish. So it was at that point I thought, okay, here we go, you know. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm staring at the barrel of a gun and there's a muzzle flash. Shot fired, shot fired, I'm hit. So I took the first shot to my face. Uh, my eyes locked in with his eyes. I start to turn and as I'm turning to my right to uh, do a tactical retreat, I, I was drawing my firearm but the vest did not stop the round from penetrating my body. And, the, and then I took a second shot to the left side of my left uh, breast. Bullet went all the way into my chest. So then I turn around and we have this little gun battle. I had a duty to go and pursue. It wasn't about um, anything else other than me really feeling like, hell no, you don't get to shoot me and then just run. Being a police officer in the United States is one of the country's most dangerous professions. Between 2003 and 2014, over 669,000 officers were treated in emergency rooms for non-fatal injuries, with the largest percentage occurring after suffering an average of 55,704 assaults each year. In the last 15 years, an average of 111 police officers lost their lives in the line of duty per year a number that indicates a cop is almost four times as likely to suffer a fatal injury than all other occupations combined. And yet many of our men and women in law enforcement are forced to cope with the aftermath of a critical incident on their own, often betrayed by their agencies and the failure of the systems they thought would help, but instead leave them feeling forgotten and alone. Do our police officers receive the care they deserve after suffering a physical or mental injury in the line of duty? These are the stories of the Wounded Blue. After decades of education and spreading awareness, most people have recognized the fact our men and women who serve in the military and return from tours within the theater of war and conflict see and experience terrible things, which can have a detrimental impact on their physical and mental well-being. The condition commonly known as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, affects anywhere from 10% to 31% of our combat veterans. Given similar circumstances, is there a difference in the way our police officers are affected? Yo, um. Can you see him? Can we get out of here? We got him. 
You need to get out of here. I have an officer hit in the lake. Give me cars here. Code 10. Trev, I got you. I got you. Watch out. Incidents like these have a tremendous impact on our police officers. Retired Las Vegas Police Lieutenant Randy Sutton explains. Law enforcement officers are on the front lines of seeing all of the ugliness that humanity is capable of. Now, it's not always that way, but the exposure to cruelty, to violence, to violent death, to tragedy, to seeing the human experience up close and personal and being involved in it day after day, month after month, year after year, can take a tremendous toll on the psyche of a law enforcement officer. We can make a huge list of of the individual things that an officer may see throughout his or her career, you know, 20 years plus that, that might bother them, but you can put a lot of it into a category that's gonna bother them the most by the things that you're not supposed to see. And, and what does that mean? Because we hear that a lot, things that, that most people are not supposed to see. To me, that means things that your brain is not supposed to process. There's funeral home death where, where the, the human experience uh, is is common you know you 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 see a relative laid out in a casket and it's very it's very sterile it's very clean that's not what a cop sees a cop sees violent death they see they see the trauma to a body they see the um, effect that it has on the survivors on the children on the wives on the husbands and it is it is emotionally devastating at times this can lead to post-traumatic stress injury, and that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. Once you see the malevolence of man, once you see that bad things really do happen from bad people or bad incidences, that's difficult to come back from. So uh, in the huge categories that we could talk about of, of what that malevolence is, whether it be a shooting, you've had to take somebody's life, somebody's tried to take your life, you've seen the life of somebody else taken, you've seen a difficult, um, victim of a crime, once your brain kind of recognizes there are really bad people that can do really bad things, you don't typically come back from that. You at least don't forget it. Um, what do you have for us? Shot fired, shot fired, I'm hit. Officer Anne Marie Carrizales, after being shot multiple times, pursued the suspects for nearly 10 minutes. They were taken into custody shortly thereafter in the Houston area allowing her to assess her injuries. I had an entry and an exit wound in my face. My earlobe, they, they reattached in the trauma room, they reattached the earlobe to the ear. The earlobe did not, it just wasn't healing correctly. It wasn't getting adequate blood flow, so they ended up having to do a surgery. The breast injury developed a massive infection inside due to pieces of Kevlar that went undetected. So I went through a couple of surgeries, several surgeries after the injuries um, to correct and fix issues that I was having with, with the uh, damage that was done from the bullets. But soon, Officer Carrizales and those who loved her the most began to see changes that went well beyond her physical injuries. I knew I was in a fight when I had a massive anxiety, panic attack while on duty in my patrol car. I had gone back to work, I was doing my job, was doing what I was supposed to be doing, which is come back to work and do your job. I ended up having a massive panic attack in my car, I thought I was having a heart attack. I ended up at the hospital. I remember getting sent home. Um, that next day was going to be my Friday, that next night. My sergeant said, take that night off, and then you'll go on your regular days off. Those three days, they were horrible, horrible. I, was ha I couldn't stop crying. I was shaking. I was sweating. Um, my stomach was in knots. I was throwing up. I don't know how many times I threw up in those three days. Post-traumatic stress is, is very serious um, because it causes changes, and that's the most difficult part. Law enforcement job in itself is very difficult and stressful, but... Uh, post-traumatic stress, in my opinion, kind of changes the game. 
Uh, once you're actually dealing with a stress that you're not able to get rid of or that is changing your life, and we're not talking in the ways of you were an accountant before you were in law enforcement, you were home nine to five and your family loved it and now you work night shift, that's stress, that's tough to deal with. But when post-traumatic stress happens, Again, your brain doesn't know what to do with that. It doesn't know how to process that kind of information. It doesn't work the same as it did for the things that you've learned over your last decades of life. When I hear criticism of law enforcement um, being voiced in a way that says, hey, look, you know what you were getting into when you took the job, um, it, it, it really, it bothers me. It, it, it makes me angry because no one can be prepared for what the job does to you. There isn't any way Uluga police officer Charles Neal and Talala police officer Stephen Pales could have prepared themselves for what they encountered on May 27, 2015. I received a call, a, a, a request for backup from the town north of us. There was a, two Hispanic males, one Hispanic female. So we decided to approach the vehicle from the driver's side. He rolled down the back window about two or three inches and wouldn't roll it any further. At that time, the, the vehicle, the driver decided to take off. Officer Pales took the lead in pursuit of the suspects, quickly reaching speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour. Shots fired. Initially, the officer I was backing up was in front of me. He took uh, several rounds of uh, rifle fire to, uh, to his windshield. So he had fallen back, and uh, I passed him on the right to take, take the lead. We chased him about 28 miles, and uh, the whole time they were firing at us. 505, The suspects continued to target assault rifle fire at the pursuing officers when a sudden nightmarish scenario unfolded. Oh my gosh, I think one of our units was just shot. One of the rounds went through the windshield of the vehicle and struck me in the forehead. Um, I, I blacked out. After I blacked out, my vehicle left the roadway. I struck a tree trunk at about 110 miles an hour. The vehicle rolled in about 14 times. And I, I can remember uh, re repeating my boys' names. I have three boys. I remember I kept repeating their names and their ages over and over in my head. When I got to the hospital, of course, I had the uh, gunshot wound to the forehead. Um, I had a, two uh, ruptured discs in my back and neck. And really just over the whole body, knees, arms, elbows. I had to have a, I implanted a neurostimulator in, in my neck and back. Lieutenant Neal's wife, Sharissa, describes how she reacted after being notified. My everything stopped. All of my thoughts stopped everything. And all I could think about is anybody you've ever seen on TV or in the movies or heard about that's been shot in the head, they don't live. Or if they live, they're never a person again. And so in my head, I'm thinking about how I'm going to tell the kids that they've lost their dad, um, that their dad's not here anymore. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to think of what his favorite song is so I can play to his funeral. And trying to think about how I'm going to have to be strong for the people around me, my mom, my kids, those kind of people. I was in a, a intensive care for seven days. Yeah, uh, after that, uh, pr pretty much daily, I was uh, back at the hospital. We had uh, speech therapy, uh, physical therapy, uh, cognitive issues from uh, the gunshot wound to the left front of your forehead. Uh, that part of your brain controls your motor skills, uh, speech, memory, have a lot of problems with uh, short-term memory. The physical and mental injuries Officer Carrizales and Lieutenant Neal suffered during their heroic actions bring forth an important question. Do our police officers receive adequate care in the aftermath of a critical incident? Imagine being shot in the line of duty. Imagine being in a car wreck 
receiving devastating injuries. Imagine being stabbed. Imagine being hit in the head with a brick and having brain damage. And then having your own department, your own city, the people that you gave quite literally years of your life to deny the claim. Lieutenant Neal, among other injuries, took a 223 caliber round to the head, but was released from the hospital after just seven days because that was the limit on his private insurance and workers' comp had yet to accept the claim. He saw a neurosurgeon and a trauma doctor. The neurosurgeon said um, he had a brain bleed, which is why he was in ICU. Um, it was a slight brain bleed and there was an oxygen bubble that was absorbed back into his body. So that ended up being okay, but all he saw was a neurosurgeon. And for months, we went back to the neurosurgeon and he kept saying, I wanna release you. And I'd say, well, we have to go somewhere else. And so he would refer us to our neurologist and the workers' comp would turn it down. After a year of workers' comp repeatedly denying the referral to a neurologist, the Neals brought the issue to the local media and soon after the claim was approved. But medical treatment was only part of the problem. As an officer, most of us work two jobs. Uh, so I was worked work those two jobs. Uh, I was a full-time student. And I also worked security jobs here and there. So we were living pretty good at the time uh, the, before the accident. And, uh, after the accident, with with the cut and pay, we, we had to sell our house. I, I, I sold my Jeep, I sold my truck, and uh, we pretty much had, have to, had to downsize and, and learn how to do with less. Uh, it, it, it was a, it was and is, it's, it's still a pretty challenging time. I have uh, three boys. Uh, the oldest one's 14, has just started high school. So, uh, trying to get them everything they need uh, for school and to, to get prepared, it, it, it's a big strain. The financial toll on the Neals was devastating. Between Charles's two full-time jobs working for the Uliga Police Department and the Rogers State University Police Department respectively, he was taking home about $1,500 per week. After being shot, he lost the university police job and was left with the $375 per week paid by workers' comp a debilitating loss of 75% of his family's income and no support structure in place by his agency, city, or state to care for one of their own. It's a weekly, daily, even monthly challenge of, of what we're gonna juggle how to, how to get the bills paid, uh, how, how to even uh, put food on the table. We have three boys, so it's, it's a real struggle. You know, Charles is a hero. He stopped three guys that were really bad going to do a really bad thing. And then he has to think about, well, I did that and it's ruined my family financially. And so he feels guilt over that when he shouldn't. Um, so that's really tough on him. I think that the way that things were handled in the aftermath could certainly have been better. I was. I was dealing with a lot of um, things that I really didn't know how to, to deal with because you're already dealing with the trauma of what happened to you physically. And then I was probably numb and kind of on autopilot for during that time and my family was really struggling and I didn't really notice. Uh, so that kind of was festering. And then uh, take into consideration all that goes on with you're, now you're off and you're going to deal with workman's comp. and the agency kind of just leaves you to fend for yourself with all of that. I mean, it was, it was frustrating. It was frustrating and I was very angry because I felt very alone. We have a mission to do. We have calls to take. We have investigations to do. We have people to help no matter what shape you're in. So if you're unable to do that, I think there's a stigma from those that are still able to do that. I think you may get a stigma from those that, well, I saw a fatal wreck as well with a child. Uh, I went to a sexual assault. Uh, I saw a family member hurt and I'm still able to go to work. Why isn't the other person able to go to work? I went through a different, it was just different emotions. It was like sometimes I felt sad, like being on a playground and nobody wants to play with you. You know, when you were a kid and one day they're your friends and the next day they're not. And, 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 it, and it's, it's hard as a kid to, you know, go through that stuff. But it's kind of like that. And, you know, that might sound silly to some people, but unless you've walked in those boots, you just don't know how that feels. You're sitting there trying to process all of this, but then, then you've got the added stress of, like, trying to understand what you did wrong. And, and you know, the thing is, more times than not, you didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. 
Officer Carrizales, in addition to suffering from PTSD, also lost a significant portion of her salary when her expected paycheck was whittled down to base pay and suddenly came in small, unpredictable increments. I went from getting my paycheck plus whatever extra duties I was, extra jobs I had. So I went, you know, I remember the payday after I got shot, like not getting paid and or getting like two hundred dollars, and I was I flipped out, like wow, what's going on here? Because no one had explained that part to me, you know and prepared me for it, I guess, is what I'm looking for. So you're getting little pieces of your base, base salary. You know, you don't even get that all in one. You get it in little pieces. Like, nobody can pay bills that way. So we had issues making ends meet during that time. This is taking place all over America. This is a national tragedy. This is something that is, that is not known within the American public. It is not even known oftentimes within law enforcement circles itself until it happens to you. And then when it happens to you and you come to realize that you have been injured severely, you expect that your department, that your city is going to help you to heal. And if you can't heal, you're not going to have to worry about putting food on the table and taking care of your family. But this is not what is happening in this country. Financial issues after suffering a debilitating injury seem to be the norm amongst our police officers across the country. Deputy Eddie Richardson, while working for the Lexington County Sheriff's Office in South Carolina, was sent to investigate a suspicious vehicle on August 1, 2016. What he didn't know was the suspect behind the wheel that day had lethal intentions. And it was just like the movie Ace Ventura. His head comes up out the side because the windshield had all the cracks and it comes up out the side and he just pedal to the metal and I had nowhere to go. Nowhere. And it's not like it was his only egress. He had so many different ways he could have gone, but he aimed that car right at me and just drove me down. And I had enough time to blade my body and throw out my left hand. All I could think of is don't go under the car as I threw out my hand and I felt it make contact with the hood and my feet went out from underneath me and all I said was hey. And I was I was up in the air. I don't recall how I got off the car. It, it's not, I've tried many different forms of regression to try and remember how it was. All I know is that SLED, our state law enforcement division, found my fibers from my uniform all over the A-pillar and, and the windshield and stuff, so I'm assuming I made contact with it. Um, the next thing I remember is landing on my right foot and seeing my left foot right here and thinking, I'm not built like that. I don't bend that way. I'm not a ballerina. As Deputy Richardson found himself awkwardly balancing near the windshield of the vehicle, the suspect continued to keep the vehicle in motion. In fear of his life, Deputy Richardson shot the suspect in self-defense. He was wanted uh, for auto theft. The vehicle he was driving was stolen. Um, uh, had, had a license. His license had been revoked. Um, and he was under investigation for multiple different uh, uh, grand larceny type uh, activities and bur I believe burglary activities in the area. But the injuries Deputy Richardson incurred left him permanently disabled as he suffers from extensive nerve damage, a destroyed spinal disc, and torn cartilage in his hip. The incident forced him into medical retirement. I set my retirement date for about a month out and I'd been trying to contact since April. What, what are my benefits gonna be from the county? I want to say it was the 27th or the 28th of August was a Sunday was my set retirement date. The Friday before that, so three days before, an hour before the close of business, I get the phone call, you don't get any medical benefits as part of your retirement. We'll keep taking care of your comp, but you didn't work here 10 continuous years under the county policy to get medical for your family. Now at this point, my wife had quit work to take care of me because I wasn't getting out of bed. The depression was insane were the levels that it had reached for me because I couldn't do anything that I used to be able to do. I wasn't the provider anymore. We'd almost lost our house twice. If it weren't for local motorcycle groups, we wouldn't have had a place to live. And now they're telling me, by the way, you don't get, you don't get medical and your retirement starts in three days. Similar to Deputy Richardson, retired Corpus Christi police officer Sean Smotherman suffered numerous debilitating injuries throughout his career, including one as a result of a February 2015 incident in which he was rear-ended by a vehicle going 84 miles per hour while sitting in his patrol vehicle preparing to investigate a traffic accident. 
I, I don't remember a whole bunch after the accident. What I remember was like the smell of smoke. I thought the car was on fire. So I got out, but my legs wouldn't work. So when I got out, I, I fell down and I was trying to pick myself back up. And that was the last thing I remember. Um, from what I was told later, I was kind of fighting with a lieutenant there who was trying to get me into an ambulance and I was like pushing him off and telling him I wasn't going to go. I, I don't remember any of it. During his eight years with the agency, Officer Smotherman was injured at least 31 times, including a knee injury in which his ACL was torn, traffic accidents which resulted in three herniated discs in his back, and multiple concussions, one of which occurred after being hit directly in the head with a baseball bat, the latter of which resulted in a traumatic brain injury. Apparently the areas of my brain that are messed up deal with everything from like problem solving, emotion, um, aggressiveness, anger, all, all that different stuff. And uh, so, you know, I'm trying to do math problems that I could do when I was an eight year old and I can't do now, or I, I'm trying to do a puzzle that, you know, is for a 12 year old and I mean, it's like calculus. So a bunch of different things in my brain are just off. And I never had that testing done before, you know, nobody ever sent me to do it to see what was wrong with it so I could get treatment for it. So, I mean, this could have been going on since 2010 for all I know. Those brain injuries were ignored by workers' comp who refused to pay for additional tests and treatment as early as 2011 when Officer Smotherman was diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, a condition he was told would resolve itself within 30 days. Even after a neurologist indicated every new head injury compounds the previous one. People forget that we're human. You know, it, it, we're no longer, I'm no longer Michael Sean Smotherman. I am officer number 6707 and I have a dollar sign next to my name. You know, this is what that officer is worth. If he doesn't meet that worth, then get rid of him, you know. Um, and that's what I felt like, you know, I, I felt like as long as I could come back to work, I was useful to the department. I, th they could use me. The minute I couldn't, even though it was work related, throw them away. Goodbye. After being forced into medical retirement in September 2015, Officer Smotherman was given no disability benefits and was reimbursed for the retirement contributions he made during his eight-year career, which after taxes was $23,000. The workers' comp benefit he receives equals a 50% loss in income, a testament to the financial ruin a young officer can find themselves in when suffering a career-ending injury. Look further and you'll find this national tragedy brings forth stories that are often hard to believe until you hear them firsthand. This is Officer Phil Russell, a 30-year veteran of the Norwalk Police Department. An individual puts 30 years into protecting the city, protecting the people, and then to have them turn around and just walk away from you, you know, is, is heartbreaking. It's, it's disturbing. It, it's, I don't even have words to say or express how I felt, you know, betrayal, a whole lot of things. A lifelong resident of Norwalk, Officer Russell had a life-altering incident on September 5th, 2017 when he was accidentally shot by his supervisor as they were cleaning their weapons at the department's firearms range. We had training at the station because we have a range there. Um, first part of it was um, class, work, and procedures and stuff. And then we moved to the range to utilize what we had learned. So we proceeded to do that. Uh, we finished the training. The one thing about the Glock is that you have to pull the trigger to release a, a mechanism that allows you to break the, the handgun down. So I had done that with mine and I was about to break mine down. We were talking, uh, my sergeant had come out and we were talking about something, we were laughing and all, and he was like, yeah, I, I, I know, you have to pull the trigger, right, to, to, to release, I said, yeah. And I proceeded to go back to cleaning my gun and I heard this bang and I looked down. I really didn't notice my arm at first, that was my chest. I saw all this blood and, and stuff, and, and my sergeant was like pastely like white and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and kind of went down after that. Phil was rushed to the hospital where doctors indicated the bullet had traveled through his right forearm and into his chest. His wife, Debbie, arrived soon after to a chaotic scene of cops, administrators, and city politicians. I just didn't know, like, is he going to be okay? What's going to happen? Is he gonna die? Is he gonna live? Uh, you know, is he gonna be 
crippled? Is he gonna be a paraplegic? I, I, I didn't know, I didn't have answers. Well, the bullet went through my, my forearm and then in my chest and I got nerve damage. I'm right-handed, so my strength, everything is dwindled. Phil began receiving workers' comp while recovering from injuries caused by the bullet still in his chest, when his health suddenly began a rapid and alarming decline. I've always been a diabetic. I've been a diabetic for 30 years, but it's never impeded me from being who I am, a good police officer. When I got shot, the stress and everything made my body go haywire, um, to the point where I, I need kidneys. I'm on a uh, kidney transplant list. Um, I'm on dialysis. Every day is a, is a struggle. It's a roller coaster. His emotional well-being, his physical health, everything has declined. Uh, severe depression, um, and I can tell you that he stays in bed most of the day. He's up for a few hours, goes to dialysis, comes home, goes to bed. There are times when, for no reason, I'll just start crying. Um, or I'll get into a rage. No reason. Um, there are times when I wake up at night screaming and I can smell gunpowder, I can smell blood. I don't, I, I mean, I have a blood pressure machine, I have an oxygen um, reader, I have the sugar machine, and every night, every day is different from the next because he's been in and out of the hospital and I don't know if the one time that he goes, that he's not gonna come out. Phil's health began to decline rapidly. He began suffering from and was diagnosed with PTSD in addition to severe nerve damage in his right hand, as well as a bullet that still remains in his chest. After six months, his kidneys began to fail, putting him on dialysis and in need of a transplant. Workers' comp determined his sudden failing health was the result of a pre-existing condition and denied his claim. Without me knowing, you know, I, I was getting a paycheck, so I, I thought it was still through workman's comp, and I didn't realize it until a, a lieutenant informed me that um, they were taking my sick time and my vacation time. Once that was over with, I had no paycheck, which means no paycheck, no insurance, no nothing, you know. Nobody told you? No. And that, that hurt, you know, and... I sit there every day, you know, wondering what what I do wrong. Phil was not notified of the workers' comp denial in May 2018. All the while, and unbeknownst to him, it was his vacation and sick time being used to fund his paycheck from May 2018 through August 2018. Suddenly, he was faced with having to go back to work or lose his insurance. Workers' comp was contesting his PTSD, as well as the fact his kidney failure was a direct result of being shot. You have an officer that's served the city for over 30 years. You have a tragic incident that shouldn't have occurred. Now you're having different medical issues that are happening and you don't know what tomorrow holds, which is really the thing that I think is wearing on Phil and I think it's wearing on his family tremendously. The fact that they're using my, my, my diabetes as a form of an escape goat, as in, well, he's any problems that he has is is deemed to that, you know, is a, is 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 just beyond me. Prior to me getting hurt, September fourth, I was fine. Honestly, I think that you know people don't think that something like this could happen to them, and I don't think people put the thought through of what would happen if this happened to you. But now it's in your face, and you see it. And I don't know, because like I said, I, I kind of like, I've seen things in a different way through all of this. The city and the police departments, the towns and their police departments, they have a responsibility, a duty to make sure that their officers that are willing to risk their lives are properly taken care of. My husband put 30 years into the Norwalk Police Department. He put his life on the line. He was ready to die for his city. And he got shot on somebody else's mistake. And because of that mistake, he 
he's, his life is in jeopardy and he does not have the support of the same city that he protected and served for 30 years. And it breaks my heart and it hurts me every night that this is happening to him. <sighs> you know, you don't know anything until you walk in an individual's shoes, you know? And that's one thing that I, I kind of hurt with workman's comp. Uh, there are people that are paper and pencil pushers and they don't do what we do. And they don't see what we see. I mean, they'll see stuff on the news, but they can get the TV and turn it off. They don't want to hear it or turn the radio off. We can't do that, you know? We can't go to a call and say, well, that's bad. Let me turn around. I, I want something easier, you know? That's what we were paid to do. That's what we do. And we're human beings, you know? And our brains are like sponges, and you absorb this stuff in, and you can't get it out. You know, and when something traumatic like that happens, when you're lying on a floor bleeding out and you're wondering, is this it? This morning, is that the last time I'm going to see my wife and my kids? You know, that affects you. There is one common theme with a police officer who has been injured or disabled in the line of duty, and that is that they feel forgotten, that they feel alone. This is the common theme, and this is devastating not only to the mental health, but to the physical health as well, especially when you're talking about trying to heal someone physically. If they feel abandoned, if they feel alone, that creates even more and more stress. We are taught to survive the streets to make it home, right? To survive that fight, but we don't know and nobody tells you and they don't train you and teach you how to survive in the aftermath, how to survive the fight after the fight. They're not doing that. And what good is it to teach us how to survive on these streets and until we get home and everything falls to crap and we don't know what's happening to us and we don't know what to do about it. Our families are falling, our families are struggling, my kids are crying, my marriage is on the rocks because nobody told me that I'm supposed to be still fighting here. You know, I, I make it home and I thought that's great, I made it home, now we just got to physically heal up and let's go. Oh no. That, like I said, is the easy part. You can't unsee the things you've seen. You can't stop having the negative and dangerous thoughts that you have. You can't stop having nightmares or flashbacks at night just because you want to stop and because you're tough. Uh, that, that's a brain problem. That's something your limbic system is doing to you. Uh, it thinks it's doing it in a good manner, but uh, that's not something you can just think your, think your way out of. Uh, there's no magic pill for that. I wish there was. Uh, there's no book you can read and figure out how to stop having nightmares. You've got to get past the traumatic stress. You've got to get past the fight or flight of it all. The way you are treated as a law enforcement officer by your own administration, by the people that you work with, that in and of itself can create post-traumatic stress. And we already have a terrifically high suicide rate. The profession of law enforcement, more police officers will take their lives than die in the line of duty. This is, this is a devastating reality to law enforcement. And feelings of abandonment, feelings of being alone after you've been injured, this can lead to the worst, including suicide. It was on June 4, 2012, when the tragic story of Phoenix police officer Craig Tiger first began to unfold, when he and his partner were involved in a shooting at a local park and public pool, where an irate man with a baseball bat was said to be threatening people. Within seconds of police arrival, the man disobeyed commands to put the bat down and charged Officer Tiger, forcing him to shoot the suspect. I, I happened to be the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association president at the time, and the day that Officer Tiger got in his shooting, I happened to be the guy on call, so I went out to the shooting at the park that day and um, met with uh, Craig and the other officer and uh, represented them through that process. Um, and so I was there literally from the very first, first moment that the whole thing happened. The shooting was the beginning of a downward spiral for Officer Tiger, as the immediate undiagnosed effects of PTSD began to take their toll on his marriage, leaving the veteran officer to self-medicate by abusing alcohol. This is Rebecca Tiger, a retired Phoenix police officer and Craig's ex-wife. I remember I went and I, I bought this, um, like a little pocket angel, and like it has like a, some 
verse, Bible verse on it mm -hmm. um, about, you know, our protectors, St. Michael, or something like that. And I gave that to him and I, I hugged him, you know, we hugged and, you know, he thanked me for it and said that it mean, meant a lot to him. And, um, and it was just very, he says, you know, we talked about how he wasn't sleeping at the time, but I didn't know that he was self-medicating with alcohol. Craig told me that he doesn't sleep, that he didn't sleep, he wasn't sleeping because every time he closed his eyes, he relived the shooting. He, he saw, literally told me that he saw that he, when he fired a shot that the round went through the man's forehead and he kept reliving that and he couldn't get it out of his, his mind's eye and it was clearly a torment for him. Having lost his marriage and all the while dealing with worsening PTSD symptoms, Craig was stopped by state police on June 4, 2013, the one-year anniversary of his shooting, and found to be driving intoxicated en route to his family's northern Arizona cabin, where he told authorities he planned on committing suicide. Craig was immediately checked into a behavioral health center where he stayed for several weeks. Every time he tried to sleep, that's all that his words were, that's all I see, that's all I see, and I try to... Every time I close my eyes, that's all I see. So when I talked to him first after his DUI and I learned that he had or wanted to take his life, I just could not believe that, that he could leave his kids. It was on the one year anniversary, which was highly significant, I believe, because that was the breaking point for Craig. He just, he had fought it, I think, as long as he could. And on that anniversary date, he went up who was headed up to his cabin, his family's cabins, purposely to commit suicide. Once he was diagnosed with PTSD, when he was in the Behavioral Health Center, um, that was the first time that I really heard about PTSD with law enforcement. It was never brought up. We never talked about it as an agency or you know, at your yearly trainings, or we talked about mental health issues with the public but we didn't talk about it with law enforcement. Now officially diagnosed with PTSD and receiving treatment, Craig was on administrative leave pending the outcome of the Phoenix Police Department's disciplinary action for his DUI arrest. There was no dispute that he was intoxicated while driving, um, but they marched along, the police chief at the time marched along like this was just Saturday night out drinking and a guy had too many and got popped for DUI. He was completely clueless, totally calloused, totally unconcerned with Officer Tiger's well-being. Craig was diagnosed with PTSD um, right after the, the suicide attempt. And then when he left there and he started with other doctors, he was diagnosed again and again with PTSD. So when he was fighting for his job, to retain his job, um, the, our chief at the time chose to fire him for the misdemeanor DUI. And that was the most despicable thing that I have ever experienced in my nearly 40 years of law enforcement. You talk about a complete failure of leadership. That is the textbook. And it was very disgusting and disturbing, not just for me as, as the association leader, but the entire department saw what was going on and how Officer Craig Tiger was not being taken care of. The chief basically said that, um, you know, Craig was fired for his DUI. He wasn't fired for PTSD. Um, but the chief never acknowledged the PTSD as being an on duty injury and that drinking is part of it. And Craig attempted suicide on the anniversary date of his shooting. How much more of a direct line can you get that this? incident affected him. Officer Tiger applied for workers' comp benefits reference his diagnosed PTSD on July 24, 2013. He was denied benefits on August 12, 2013. Based on the decision by then Phoenix Police Chief Daniel Garcia, Craig was fired for the DUI on August 23, 2013. He obtained counsel in an effort to fight for workers' comp benefits, but went from August 2013 to May 2014 with no paycheck and no insurance. During this time, he lost nearly 40 pounds. He was already suicidal. He's now lost his job. 
He doesn't know when he's going to receive any kind of money. It turned out to be nine months, but he didn't know when. He has to have an attorneys and pay for attorneys. Um, he started using his money that he had saved for his retirement, his deferred comp money, to live off of, to pay his mortgage. He just kind of lost the will, I think, and, and ultimately abandoned, despite my pleadings that I believed, absolutely believe that you get this in front of a panel of reasonably minded citizens, which is what our Civil Service Review Board was, I guarantee you there wouldn't have been a dry eye in the room and he'd have got his job back. It was just that blatantly obvious that this was not, you know, a, a typical misconduct event. He wasn't eating. Um, he was, I mean, there was times when he was just so disoriented, just didn't know today from tomorrow, just so confused, just the malnutrition, just, and he was still having the nightmares. He wasn't drinking anymore, um, but he wasn't sleeping. Um, he was hospitalized three different times over the next year. Craig won workers' comp benefits in June 2014, finally indicating the officer-involved shooting in 2012 was the cause of his mental illness. But the downward spiral he had long been experiencing had already reached its end. It was on November, November 5th. 2014, uh, we had a parent-teacher conference for one of our kids at their school, and Craig did not show up. And so I drove out to his house. And so I, you know, I, I walked up to the house, and in his windows, his front windows were were open. The the curtains were open, and this. The windows were open, so the screen was there. And I could see from his front window, I could see to his backyard. Um, and the, the curtains were open there too, so I could see all the way through. And I could see uh, he had a fire pit back there. And I could see his uniforms on the fire pit. And so I knocked on the door and I called for him and he didn't come. His door was unlocked and so I opened the door and yelled for him. and. And I can see notes there on his computer. And I kind of glanced over at the notes and I could see that it's his, you know, his notes. And, and he was not there. Um, and so reading in his notes, he says that he was going up north. And that was where his family had a cabin. And um, so we, you know, put out a, a bulletin basically for his car and for him and you know if located he's suicidal and so you know I went home that day and, and prayed a lot that night just just begging him to you know please just answer the phone and and that was the next morning it was probably about seven o'clock in the morning and the knock at the door and there's two police officers and they told me that um, his body was found um, he was in his car and he had overdosed and I just sat there and just thought of my kids sleeping and you know once they wake up that their their world is just shattered and you know right now they just I can still remember that just sitting on the couch thinking right now they're just just little kids with two parents once they wake up it's done my son came out sat on the couch with me and so I told him you know that daddy's heart stopped you know the medicine he was on made daddy's heart stop and you know he's only six he, kids don't understand you know the, how permanent death is and 
you know, we cried. We sat on the couch and cried. And my daughter, you know, was still sleeping. I just did not want to. I just wanted her to keep sleeping. I didn't want to ruin her world, you know, by telling her that. But so of course, when she wakes up, you know, I had to tell her, and that just started the the months of just. I feel like my head would just went gray, you know, like everything in my head, all my thoughts, everything, just my head spinning for the next, God, what felt like probably the next year and a half <laughs> where my head, you know, before I could stand up straight and have my thoughts together, you know. The law enforcement community needs to get away from that, uh, you know, just suck it up and, uh, you know, move on, march on. That, I get that. But the reality is, you know, not everybody is wired the same way. And we unfortunately see a lot of things that the average, you know, citizen doesn't fortunately have to see or do. So he didn't have to die, but that death started a long time before that shooting and a long time before that death. There were opportunities missed all along the way to save Officer Tiger. It was finally proving, showing everyone else what we already knew, that you know Craig was injured in a shooting. He didn't die that day, and you couldn't see his injuries, but he died from those injuries. And we knew that, and the ones that were fighting for it knew that. But now his invisible injury was finally being seen. There's not a lot of quit in me, but I went to some, some dark places. I'm a fighter, and I'm not afraid to admit when I am hurting or, you know, I remember saying, I quit. And he cried and he said, um, baby, you're scaring me. You know, I'm not used to hearing you say that. What do you mean? Do you want to kill yourself? And I said, um, really thought of that. So I said, well, I don't want to kill myself, but I just want to quit. I don't want to be strong anymore. I'm tired of fighting. I'm fighting this pain that's trying to heal up. I'm fighting workman's comp. I'm fighting to understand why people are treating me this way at work. What did I do? What did I do? You know? So it was tough. But I, I can honestly say that I, I that the thought of ending my life came into my head. So knowing how low I felt and how helpless I felt and hopeless at times, knowing how bad that felt for me, I cannot imagine that there's a lower than that and that we have so many of our officers that are there, that are that low, that are lower than that. I couldn't imagine how that must feel that just saying, Forget it, I, I'd rather be dead than have to deal with this anymore. The fact that, you know, prior to me having this, things seemed more vivid, you know what I mean? You could feel things, sense things, smell things, you know? You felt vibrant, you felt, with this, you just feel like a shell. You don't really have any emotions, I mean, you see something, you're like, you know, and when your, your emotions do come out, you, you don't even know why, you know? It's not like, well, I heard a sad song or my son did something really great and I'm proud of him, you know? It's just, comes on, goes off. You wake up and you're just like, another day, you know? And it's like, it's like almost like a black and white movie back in the days, and then they colorize them, you get a different 
perspective of everything, you know, what they were wearing, what she looks like, the scenery. With me, it's black and white. There is no feeling or vibrance or smells or joyfulness. My motto since the beginning, and I've been just shaking my head, you know, because Craig should not have lost his life. It was, his death was preventable. If he would have been treated correctly, like any other physical injury, you know, from the job, I believe Craig would still be here. So my motto since the beginning is not one more. And it was just a motto that I had to myself, but no one should die from PTSD. After several years of advocacy following Officer Tiger's death, the Craig Tiger Act was signed by Arizona Governor Ducey on April 23, 2018. In addition to a comprehensive study on PTSD, the bill allows for 36 visits to a licensed treatment professional each time they are exposed to a traumatic event during the course of duty. A welcome step towards finally recognizing PTSD and the effect it can have on our police officers. Because right now, like I say, it's like trying to grab smoke talking about PTSD and first responders. We all need to know what the reality is and what the extent is. And I appreciate the fear and concern that, oh my God, everybody's going to you know, suffer from this at some point in their career. Uh, it's not true. Uh, unfortunately, what you see from police officers 99.9% .9 of the time, including Officer Craig Tiger, they suffer alone. They suffer in silence because they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to have to retire. They don't want to be sick. So they don't say anything. And that's the worst thing to do because that just exacerbates the issues with PTSD. Getting strong education out to individual officers to know that post-traumatic stress does not have to be life-threatening. It does not have to be career-ending. It is life-changing, but that can be helped. So letting them know this is not a you crazy. This is not you being weak. This is not your coworker being weak. This is a brain thing. This is the limbic system that thinks you're always in, in, in trouble. So it's bringing back flashbacks. It's bringing back reminders. Um, it's changed the way that you perceive yourself, other people in the world. So this is a brain thing. This is not a weakness. This is not you messing up. This is not you unable to help. You haven't done anything wrong. This is a brain problem. Let's get it fixed. Peer counseling is paramount in ensuring our cops receive what they need in the aftermath of a critical incident. It is the key factor in assuring those feelings of hopelessness are Jennifer Markowski is a peer counselor from the Wounded Blue. Having somebody to talk to, having somebody who has been through the same thing, or at least can have an appreciation of the struggles and the mental anguish you may be going through and how it's impacting your daily life, how it's impacting your family. Having somebody that you can vent to, that you can talk to, that'll help you feel like you're not alone and help you get in touch with the resources you need. So I would have had the support from, uh, from the, the department I was working for, really, would, uh, would have helped a lot. Uh, if I could have had more, more visits with people instead of just always uh, being alone at the house while the wife is off working and the kids are at school. Um, yeah, we, we need people to be there to fill that time so you're not just continually thinking about the problems that you have. One of the things that, that I have heard constantly um, is that uh, no one can understand me. No one can understand what I've been through. So that's why peer counseling is so important because especially for a law enforcement officer, they need to be able to relate to the person that they're talking to, that they are going to share with, that they are going to share an experience that may be very, very personal to them. They often cannot relate to even their wife or their husband about this. They need to talk to someone who has been there. The complexity of these issues means a long road ahead for achieving tangible change. Both the adoption of the Craig Tiger Act as federal law, as well as the creation of a federal workers' comp system designed specifically for first responders, would be strong steps in the right direction. Our cops sacrifice themselves each day, standing strong against the evil in this world so the rest of us can live safe and normal lives. Which begs the question, why are we failing them?
These people have given everything to protect you and your livelihood. They've been to the calls that you wouldn't answer yourself. They've done the things that you expect them to do. Selfless service, integrity, respect. Look, we're short staffed. We have people that are hurt, that are working through these injuries, but they're 60, 70%. We have people that probably couldn't pass a psych test right now because they've seen and been through so much stuff and they're still working through it, but they're not 100%. It's time that you respect them and help them. They've given everything they can up to the edge of their life. And what they do have left of a life is compromised because of what they've given. They're not asking for a lot. Sincerely, they're not asking for a lot at all. But you need to take care of the people that have taken care of you this entire time and realize the fact that they put themselves where you never would and they did it for you. They didn't do it for glory. They obviously didn't do it for money. They did it because that was what their calling was. We can't expect the same, the same type of policing, the same quality of policing from someone who's operating at 50 or 60% as we could from somebody who just got out of the academy that's 100%, never dealt with death, never dealt with PTSD, doesn't have any injuries, is top physical form. Um, it's not the same. So I think departments need to get on board with the fact that they're, they're pushing officers to a point where they break. For the officers that find themselves going through the issues that many of them do after critical incidents, after cumulative post-traumatic stress issues go unaddressed, you spend any amount of time in this profession and you can't unsee the things you see. That's the way it is. But it doesn't have to be the end all. And I think that a, the, a group of, of men and women in this organization, the Wounded Blue, going out there and telling you, hey, here's my story. And what do you see when you hear my story? Well, I see a survivor, or I see a warrior, or I see this, or I see inspiration and hope. Well, guess what? I am you. And I have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is where the Wounded Blue was born from, from the pain of others, from the pain of those law enforcement officers who have had to face the terrible distress of financial difficulty, of health issues, and not being taken care of by their departments, and un unfortunately being forgotten and being alone. The mission of the Wounded Blue is to assist injured and disabled police officers with peer support, by changing the laws, by assisting them in, to get the benefits that they, that they are entitled to, to assist them to get legal uh, affairs, to assist them to get the proper medical care, and to, and to attack this problem on a universal basis throughout the United States to challenge these departments, these agencies that don't care enough about their cops. That's what the mission of the Wounded Blue is, to be a voice for the voiceless to be there for them, never forgotten, never alone.
All right, gentlemen, welcome back. Randy, what mm -hmm. a what a film, bro. I got I got choked up and I was like, God damn it. I was like, I hate this. I'm like, we're, we're live on TV. I gotta get myself under control here before we get back going. Um walk me through what the response has been since that film has come out. What are what is the feedback that you're getting that you're hearing um as a result of that uh of that film being made? So, you know, I I was, of course, intimately involved with this film. I've seen it a lot of times, and it still chokes me up. So so I I tell anybody who's going to watch this, make sure you have your tissues right next to you. Because I don't know how you could not get emotional when you see the plight of these of these men and women. Mm -hmm. um, Great show. I, I thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Jason Harney smoked it with this with this I, I mean he really worked his butt off um he he saw the mission he had no idea um that, that, that this plight was had befallen law you know other other cops and so when he when he saw it when he saw the injustice he just jumped right in with both feet i mean i never could have paid you know a filmmaker to do something of this of this magnitude so I'm forever grateful for him. And you know, he's a very talented filmmaker. You've seen his other stuff too. So if, if I could show every American that film, we could change the entire um, uh, attitude and, and, and knowledge base. Um, and we could make some significant changes. Unfortunately, uh, you know, you got, it, it gets limited viewing and, um, I'm hoping that we're actually in negotiation right now that it's going to go to a, a streaming platform uh, where it will be seen by a lot more people. But you know, you know, you, you guys that are that are watching this, you're in the law enforcement field. I had no idea. So, so you know, I when what happened to me, my career ended when I suffered a stroke in my police car in the Las Vegas Strip. And my own department turned its back on me, just said, we're not paying your medical bills. And I, I said, well, you got to pay my medical bills. And they said, yeah, well, no. And forced me to go to court, took over a year. They ruined my credit. Um, I felt completely abandoned. I felt alone. I felt betrayed by my department. And it took over a year for me to get those benefits, which were, you know, were to remind me how my bills paid. And I came to find out something. And this is probably one of the, one of the cruelest um, re revelations is that they were hoping I was going to die in the meantime. And that's what's happening across America. These third party administrators, these police agencies who farm out their, their workers comp stuff uh, and the cities and the, and the counties that, that are, that are paying the bills here, they stretch out the, uh, the time factor because it's better for them if you die. And what American can believe that? See, here's one of the, here's one of the factors that, that we face. When I talk to someone about supporting the Wounded Blue and I tell them about our mission, and they, everyone really thinks that, wait, hold a second. If you get shot in the line of duty, you get taken care of. You get a pension. You get your medical. You get, you get taken care of. So trying to even change that and, 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 and show the reality is very very challenging when it comes to getting support mm -hmm. for the wounded blue. But you know, you saw the stories there. Everybody that's on this panel probably has similar stories or have gone through something very similar. Especially when it comes down to to, uh, to the mental health aspect. You know, we we deal with both physical and and uh, emotional psychological uh, injuries, and uh, you know. The, this is, it's really, really challenging, but you know what? We have to, this is why I'm so happy to be on this panel because we have to work together. We have to fight together in order to right these wrongs. And we are very, very, um, we're, we're, we're in, in, all going our separate directions, you know, and we don't really as even law enforcement is so divided in so many ways 
that we don't have a unified voice. We don't have a unified strategy to deal with this with with this topic. So that's why I'm so happy that as I was invited to be on this panel, and I would love to, you know, everybody's feedback from this. It was amazing. It, it was such an amazing show. Uh, like Adam, I was, I was tearing up. And, and I think you, you, you hit on a lot of different uh, areas. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's a misnomer out there, like you said, where cops are going to get taken care of in the line of duty if they're injured and cops have pensions. The reality is some departments don't have pensions. That's the reality. So, I mean, but when you talk to the average Joe out there, they think, well, you got a pension. Depends on the agency. It depends on the agency. So very, very powerful film. The one thing that struck me, Randy, is watching this, and I'm thinking you did an amazing job with this, is showing this to somebody out there. Why would somebody want to become a cop? Thank God there's still people <laughs> out there that want to become officers. Thank God they're still, you know, they're not in it for the money or the glory or anything. They want to serve. But it's like, my God, some of these departments, the way they treat their people, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, what you just said has been told to me time after time. Would you have taken the job if you had known you were going to receive this kind of treatment? And that, and this, who, and who would, who, who would? would exactly. I didn't know it. I had 34 years as a cop. I had no idea that this could even be a, a reality. So mm -hmm. think about, you know, all these, all these thousands of cops out there who don't know. And that's part of, of, of our mission is to get them to understand the realities and then prepare themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I used to tell my cops, you don't rely on the department to, you know, take care of yourself. You know, educate yourself. Don't let, the, don't rely on the department. Yeah, you got to do mandatory training, but do your own homework. Have a backup plan. You know what I mean? In case something happens. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, excellent uh, documentary when it comes to highlighting those issues. Uh, as Randy's pointed out, I'm sure Pat, I know Mike and I have talked a little bit. You know, uh, we all have our different uh ways that we dealt with our stressors uh, to bring this to light in such a film like that and to bring it to light uh, in a way that uh, it can relate to other officers. It can relate to them and say, hey, look, uh, if you can't look at that film and go, hey, that's me, uh, you know, at, at at least one little point of that. So the, the best thing about this is bringing these things to the forefront. You and I both know, well, all of us know that uh, these uh, these dealings with stress, dealing with cumulative stress and dealing with post-traumatic stress uh, really took the backseat until recently. So uh, it's through the work of everybody sitting right here. You know, it's through what we have done and what what Michael has done, what Pat's doing, what Randy's doing. And um, thanks to Adam getting it out here on on this summit. You know, we are starting to see that turn. But, you know, uh, just as Pat kind of kind of hit on, there's there's 18,000 agencies out there in yeah. the United States. So right, right. Uh, everybody thinks that uh, when they see it like Las Vegas PD, they're like, oh, well, that's what every agency's like. No, no, it's not. You know, after I got shot, I, I took a round of the face. I took a round of the face and two in the leg. Uh, you know, I wound up. Uh, they took care of me financially. Financially, it was no problem. My my concern was the taking care of the family and taking care of those that were with me during the shooting. That kind of fell by the wayside. And, and that's what really kind of set me off more than anything else. Uh, we all know that it takes a lot intestinal fortitude to come back and step up after you have fallen that far. So uh, that support system is, is absolutely, it's, it's, imper it's imperilous and you've got to have it. Randy said that in his film, you know, peer support is the way to go. You've got your buddies uh, at work. Uh, you've got family members and friends at home, utilize them, take care of them. And if we can continue to do this, we're going to see this message getting pushed further and further out, which is exactly what we all want. Yeah. A very powerful film. 
I think what really sticks out to me is that throughout it, I mean, everything resonated with me. There were so many things that these officers experienced that I also experienced. And I think that's key to this discussion because when I was at the height of my struggles to the point where I didn't want to be here anymore, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one that was thinking this way, the only one who was facing these circumstances. But another big key thing that was brought up here is admin and betrayal when your department or agency turns their back on you. And this is something that is not talked about enough. And I think a lot of officers that are dealing with it, a lot of people listening to this right now, they think it's just them. They don't realize that this is happening all across the country. In fact, it's happening in other countries, Canada, the UK, Australia. And the facts are that we need to bring this out to the light to show people that this is happening much more common than we think. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, you know, we've got so many resources out there that I didn't realize. I mean, Blue Help, Wounded Blue, all these resources, I had no clue about any of them until I, until I started this recovery process. And, you know, the facts are there's endless resources out there. And those are the things that we need to educate our administrators on, our, our departments on, and, and just, you know, let our officers know that your reactions and feelings to the trauma that we see, it's normal. And we need to talk about it. We need to smash this stigma of talking about feelings and asking for help. I thought that was shameful and weakness, but it's courage and strength to say, look, I need a break. I need to take a step back. This is really affecting me because we're all humans here. And that's what we need to do as law enforcement agencies is show the public we are just like them. We are human. These things affect us. You know, we have our own family issues at home, but then we have endless trauma on the streets. Absolutely. Well said, Mike. There was um, a comment here from Sean. Um, Sean's a a fire EMS professional. Um, He brought this up. He said, um, they're starting to have unions band together to make or almost force a change for departments. Admins have a harder time saying no to multiple agencies at one time. What are you guys' thoughts on that? That unity is exactly what we need. Absolutely. And, and unfortunately, we're so fragmented. You got the FOP, you got the PVA, you got you know the different police associations, different there all kinds of different unions, and and so everybody's got their own little bailiwick. And there's a, a hesitancy to band together for the common good. And that that is something that that I I mean, I, it's nice to hear that somebody's, you know, there's a movement uh, a little bit in, in their in their area to work together. And that is exactly what we all need to do. Well, Sean's Sean's in Illinois, so they have a plethora of their own problems. That may be just be <laughs> the one the one good thing <laughs> that's happening there yeah. right now. But uh but that's, that's besides the point. But Randy made a good point. You know, we're all, you know, most agencies and organizations are, are, are in their own little corner. You know, they're, all, they're doing their own little thing. It's a power thing. Uh, we all know that. But, I mean, we, like Randy said, we need to come to get together. People aren't flocking to the first responder field anymore. It's just not like it used to be. So we need to take care of our most important asset, and that's our human assets. And do a better job that we have been in the past. This is, you know, it's a constant process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And it's going to take time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, I don't know if you guys have been uh, keeping up with, I don't want to say world events, but like uh, U.S. events. We had it, there was an article that came out. I think it was uh, the Washington Examiner or the Washington Post. Uh, It will actually wound up one of our widows from our group uh, posted it in the family chat where the suicidologist uh, with uh, CBP, the Border Patrol and Customs, uh, did a survey and did a study. And they came out with this information and are making it public to say, hey, look, the the border crisis is not affecting the uh, Border Patrol agents to the extent that it's causing their suicides. Right. <laughs> Um, and, and to that, you've got to, that's, that's a slap in the face, right? Uh, to understand that these guys are, uh, stressed about their job. Of course, they're going to have stressors outside the job, 
we all have stressors outside the job. It's like I say every time I talk. You go home, you take off the Superman suit. What do you got to do? Jimmy got an F in school, so now you got to deal with that. You got to cook some dinner. You got to pay the bills. You've got all these stressors there. The, uh, the important thing here is we know that the numbers are staggering when it comes to officers taking their own lives due to their mental health. We need to take that proactive approach, just like you guys have said. And even the officers owe it to themselves and owe it to their families to step up and take that approach one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I can't tell you, I could go home right now and I have a box full of holsters and duty belts and all the cool stuff that I bought over the years. But it, I would have never thought to go to any type of training for mental fitness. I just never would have done it. It's not the cool thing to do. And this is where we need to get this. I'm not saying it's ever gonna be cool, but what we need to do is get it out there in the forefront. Randy said the same thing. You know, they do their uh, they do their one block once a year, and that's it. That's not enough. We've got to get these guys in a in a perpetual state of using tools that are at their disposal year round, and and that'll make them a better officer, make them a better husband, maybe make them a better wife. Right? These are the things that need to come to life. So. And I think we all know, and that's well said. I mean, I think we all know that departments are going to be different in their culture, right? I mean, some departments are better at it than others. Some departments foster that type of environment, some don't. And that's the problem we have right now. Viewing, you know, we, we, you know, coming forward is not a weakness. It's a strength, like you said. And we need to continue to push that message uh, among our first responders. Yes. So I, we, uh, we have a, um, a, a summit ourselves, the Wounded Blue. Uh, we, we, we have our annual national law enforcement survival summit we we began this two years ago in las vegas um and i brought in you know every name that you guys would know kevin gill martin was part of it um uh the, jason Schechterly. <clears throat> every aspect about surviving a law enforcement career physically tactically dave smith and betsy smith were part of it um uh, uh sheriff uh sheriff mark lamb i mean really really top-notch speakers and it was so well received the first year we did it that the second year, which was just uh, a couple of months ago, we did it again in in Indiana. And it was brought there, uh, was underwritten by a couple of charities. Um, one was the widow of a police officer who had been murdered in the line of duty. And the other was a sister of a police officer who was murdered in the line of duty. So we, we have this amazing summit, right? We and, and they were and they were. They were scholarshipping most of the people. I contacted every single um, police agency and sheriff's department within 250 miles of, of where we were doing this summit and offering free seats for the, their officers. Most of the sheriffs and police chiefs didn't even bother returning my call. And those that, that we did get to uh well you know we'll uh we're really short of people right now but you know i'll see if anybody wants to go mm -hmm. the unbelievable resistance to to even incredibly uh astute training for free on topics that are life-saving is just mind-boggling to me it's like they don't even want the answers they don't care enough of, about their own cops to even make an effort to give them the tools that they need. To me, I got to tell you that you can probably sense my frustration because well, it, it, it's, un, it's unconscionable to me. Well, they don't, want the, they don't want to expose it, you know, because then they look bad. You know what I mean? Then they then they look bad. It comes back on them. Meaning, what what is command staff? What are the people doing for your officers? You know, it's ridiculous. You know, I mean, that's my opinion, Randy. I mean, that's why they do it. That, that's why they nobody you know pulled on that string and went to this amazing free training because that makes them look bad. You know, it's um, I'm sitting over here giggling because uh, you know with ILET, it's it's not even like there's a barrier to entry. Like you have to take an officer and put them in a classroom or you have to send them somewhere, 
we've we've offered the training that we've done here at Islet every year, and I'll go out to an agency, especially like in my hometown or in other places in Canada where I know officers are there. And larger agencies, 500 officers, 600 officers, and I'll go to their training team and say, I'm going to give you guys access to all of the training we have completely for free. You guys don't even have to pay for it. Like, And there's instructors that we have on our stuff that we send to them um, or that we have that they've paid. They've paid tens of thousands of dollars to have them come in to teach. Um, we're like, we're going to give you more stuff for free. They're like, awesome. It goes up the chain of command. And every single agency that we have ever offered training to has all said, no, thanks. We're good. It's, it's, <laughs> if it's not their idea, they don't get credit for it. And then there, there's no benefit to them. Right. And it's, it's just, it's a constant battle. It's not just in, in this space specifically, but it's, it's in training and law enforcement in general. Right. It's there's a there's a big hard shell around that uh, that old guard that still has to be cracked. Absolutely. And that's the biggest problem. I don't think it's the information and the resources that we have right now. Wounded Blue, all these amazing organizations. It's it's the internal battles that we face with our command staff, with the powers to be the ones that are decision makers. And I should have prefaced by saying not all departments are like that. Not all departments are like that. Some departments are very opening and, and welcome, but still a lot of them are like that, that would rather hang their people out to dry than to take some proactive steps to make their people better and get them the help they need. I mean, it's only after, it's only after, I mean, look at, look at, look at the Craig, and I'm in Arizona, look at Craig Tiger. Something like that has to happen. Guy kills himself. And something like that happens where we're, oh, geez, we better start recognizing it now. Why don't we start plucking people before they fall in upstream instead of getting them when they're down, you know, when they're going downstream and plucking them out then? Why don't we, why don't we do that before they even fall into the river? There was, there was one situation, and see, I'll let you jump in here in a second, but there was one situation that occurred this year that really hit me really hard. Um, when I saw it, and it was the two um, young sheriff's deputies out of Florida. Yes, sir. Um, and I don't like. I don't. I don't. I even talking about it now. I don't know how to emotionally respond to it because it's kind of like how many people had to drop the ball in that situation, right? You have one. You have one officer who takes his own life, and his his spouse is also works in law enforcement. They have a small child. And she takes her own life a few days later, leaving that infant in the world alone. The amount of pain that they must have been feeling is, I can't imagine it. I have four small kids. You'd have to, I mean, I'll be crawling out of a grave to fucking get back to them. So yep. I don't, I still can't, when I talk about it, I can't like comprehend it. Um, but it's, it's those situations that really drive home. Like how many people saw something and said nothing? And that has to stop. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I agree. I think that, you know, we're being reactive as, as a culture as opposed to being proactive. And most agencies, they only do something when something has occurred, something tragic, and they don't prevent it. And I, I think about as officers, we spend hundreds, maybe thousands of hours training on firearms, defensive tactics, EVOC, driving. But how many hours do we spend on resiliency, on mental health, on suicide prevention? And it's been mentioned already, but suicide is the number one killer, not just for law enforcement, but for all first responders. If you take away COVID, it's the number one killer. And yet we train and train to fight the bad guys on the street, but we don't train to save our own lives. And we're much more likely to die by our own hands in the hands of another. That is a fact. I mean, it's a undisputable fact that we are much more likely to die by our own hands than some assailant on the street. And we need to be proactive, not simply reactive. And and it's and it's underreported, Michael. So you are absolutely correct. You know, uh, those numbers that we have, the numbers that other folks are starting to collect, we know that. Uh, the CDC is going to start collecting, I think, in the next year or two. The FBI has already put their stuff out to start pulling those numbers in. But the bottom line is, is we still do not have the full picture here. No. Uh, and, and I don't know that we ever will. 
But uh, one of the things that that I wanted to mention, especially with uh, Pat and Randy discussing it, is, you know, we're so used. We're the salty dogs of, of first responders, right? We're on our way out. These young cats are coming in. This is a perfect opportunity for change to occur from the bottom up, not just from the top down. Because we are used to a change occurs from a top down kind of system. These guys and Absolutely. gals that are these guys and gals that are coming into this uh, these days are more in touch with themselves uh, as far as spiritually, uh, mentally, and all of those uh, just just understanding their their person themselves. And I think what we're going to see is we're going to see that that awareness ticks itself up. But unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to see it in our lifetime, uh, but we're dang sure not going to see it while, uh, well, while we were working. I, I don't think any one of us are still working in, uh, in law enforcement at this time. So, uh, you know, I fully expect that. Uh, Joe Willis, our learning guy, he is constantly doing those trainings uh, through, through FirstNet, just giving the training away. FirstNet uh, built by ATT just said, here, do it. And he's been kicking it uh, all over the place. But um, as you guys have pointed out, uh, you know, we could go to all the agencies we want. He's done it where he's like, hey, I want to do this for free. Nope, not going to happen. So once we start seeing these younger generation guys come into a position of power within the agencies, then I think you might finally start seeing uh, that change that we mm -hmm. all want to happen. Now, don't get me wrong, though. I mean, just us sitting here discussing it today, we know uh, it's leaps and bounds better than it was in 2015, 2016. Uh, we have, uh, I, I don't want to say we could pat ourselves on the back, but the bottom line is, is uh, the, the salty dogs right here are the ones pushing the charge, right? We're the ones out there saying, hey, look, guys, don't do it like we did it. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. Take care of the families. Uh, we don't want you to be another statistic. We don't want you to have to medically retire or we don't want you uh, committing suicide. We want you to be a whole person to retire and to enjoy life uh, for however long that may be. So absolutely, you know, that's just kind of my two cents on that one. Absolutely. Um, there's a question in the chat here, um, and I'll throw this up here for you guys to, to answer. Uh, Brian says, I'm a new chaplain serving both police and fire. How can chaplains support Leos and help them get plugged into peer support? And are there resources for chaplain training? Yes, there is. As a matter of fact, uh, the um, uh, Randy or Pat, or maybe Michael knows, there's a, a law enforcement chaplaincy association. And those guys... Uh, one of the things that really took care of me when I got shot was my agency chaplain. Uh, and to this day, up until a couple of years ago, we would go have a cup of coffee uh, once a year, just go have a cup of coffee somewhere. So uh, the training is available, uh, the, the ability for the chaplains to work into that. And there is that spiritual element when we talk about mental fitness. For some of us, we need that spiritual connection. We want that spiritual connection. And absolutely plugging those chaplains into your programs is is the way to go. I'll leave it to yeah. you guys jump on that. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, you have to have a cha or you should have a chaplain uh, part of a peer, uh, peer support team. And another thing to kind of piggyback on what you said, brother, is, is that, you know, when you're having a conversation with your chaplain, that's protected. Yeah. You're protected by the cloth. There you go. So it's, it's a privileged com communication that you're having with the chaplain, I think chaplains are much needed like you said i mean to connect not only connect on that higher level and the spiritual level which we all need but again that's privileged communication yep. you know that you can have with your chaplain so very very important i think um, the key no. too is is having that you know the chaplains do ride-alongs and being out there Absolutely. in the yep. field and i actually had a conversation yesterday with somebody and and they asked well why don't the therapists and the clinicians do the same thing and I thought it was such a powerful point because if we have agencies out there that contract with mental health professionals, they should be out there, you know, riding in the cars, seeing what we do firsthand. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, building these relationships early on and having that trust, because when that big incident happens, if you don't already have that established relationship and trust, 
you're not going to go to those people. You're not going to open up to those people. And so we need to set the foundation early on, you know, when officers are first coming in, I mean, right out of the academy, right out of FTO and pair them up with you know, chaplains, with peer support people, with mental health clinicians. And let's build these relationships early on, because the key to this whole thing is trust. If we as first responders know that we can trust the person sitting next to us or across from them, and we can fully open up to them without any repercussions, we're much more likely to do that. And that's the key to this right there. Absolutely. You brought, you bring up a great point. And one thing I do want to mention, and, and cause I come from a different lane, obviously all of you guys are law enforcement. I know, I know uh, Pat and, uh, and Mike also military, but in our regiment, we had our Padre and it was a, it's a multi-denominational mm -hmm. situation, right? Obviously in the military. Um, but one of the things I'm not a religious person whatsoever. And I had an extremely close relationship with our Padre and actually out of every, I would say 95% of our regiment has would very easily walk over and go to his house for dinner. Like he had such a profound effect on all of the soldiers that we had in our unit um, because he was open and honest and he just, he, it was about building relationships. It wasn't about shoving any type of teaching or any type of opinion it was, you knew you could go there and he, you could sit with him and he would, you could just vent for an hour and then he'd pour you a scotch, you'd have a drink and you'd go home and that was it. But it's, it's having access to those relationships and understanding that if we, if we can instill that within our departments and within our agencies where you have people there that are, are there that aren't going to judge that are, are literally just there to just be an open ear, right. For you, or just somebody to sit with you. Because sometimes we just need to have some another human being present with us and no words need to be spoken. I think I think having those open conversations now in front of everybody is is critically important. And I, I appreciate what you guys are doing so much because it's the more we give voice to this to this problem, the better chance we have at making making it actually or or lessening the problem for, for more, for people that aren't willing to speak up about it. Right. So um, one thing too, and, and we're coming close to our two hours. Um, I don't know how you guys are feeling, but I mean, I'm happy to stay on a few uh, extra minutes here. This is a great conversation. One thing for everybody in the chat, I just posted um, the link. It's a direct link. We talked about our, I got your six shirts and patches that we're doing here um, with the, the summit this year. Um, First of all, uh, I, and I, you can ask Pat because I said he gets these every year. They're the most comfortable shirts you can get because there's no sense in having a promotional shirt if you can't wear it. They're awesome. The time. Um, <laughs> awesome. And uh, here's the thing. 100% of the profit goes to support our friends at Blue Help. 100%. Every single penny goes to Blue Help. Um, and um, obviously, it's, it's comfortable, nice swag to walk around. So please consider if you have a few extra bucks, Click the link, take a look at it, and um, it would really be helping them out and um, helps push this message even farther, right? When I don't know, like I have, I have, I got your six tattooed on me, uh, but when I walk around <laughs> with that gear on all the time, you get the, the general public doesn't understand that saying for the most part, right? And they go, hey, what does that mean? And it, that that is the perfect opportunity to take five minutes out of your day and explain what this brotherhood that we have is what you know we have this conversation about thin blue line it up it's been a massive thing up here in canada right look behind randy right there right there's it's it's we there's this stigma that's been attached to things that we use internally to support one another and it's just because that misinformation is being shared and we don't do a good enough job at 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 explaining ourselves to people right? This, this industry as a whole does a really piss poor job because we go, ah, conflict, ah, screw it. Like let them think what they want. We'll just, I'll just deal with it. We have to stop taking that approach because that's the same approach we're taking to the mental health issue. And it's like, ah, whatever. That's not, I don't have to deal with that. That's not the way it is anymore. Um, and so Absolutely. anyway, that was a kind of a random rabbit hole to go down to buy, to tell you to buy some shirts and patches and shit. Um, <laughs> Does, uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on um, on anything from today? 
if if I could, I just want to jump out there real quick because I'd be remiss if I did not uh, put this out there. Uh, you know, we're sitting here and we're uh, we're totally and I totally get it because I was there. Uh, we're focusing in on our first responder wellness, right? We're focusing in on the individuals. Don't forget, Randy, when Randy had his stroke, he wasn't the only one that had a stroke that day. When Michael got into his shootout, he wasn't the only one that got in that shootout that day. And just like I said, when I got shot, I wasn't the only one that got shot that day. This has such a cascading mm -hmm. effect. Uh, the mental fitness of our first responders will affect people you have no idea it affects. But most importantly, it affects our families. It affects those that are closest mm -hmm. to us. When we lose our insurance, uh, when when we don't get what people think is that uh, lottery paycheck uh, for, oh, you got injured, you're going to make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> Not so much, right? Uh, I got to go work at Home Depot when I retire. So uh, it's no different. And all of those stressors compound and they work their way to your kids, to your uh, mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters and uh, so the, the thing here is take care of yourself so you can take care of everybody else. You're a first responder. They that's what they expect out of you. When I got shot, I still had people. Hey, I had uh, had sirens on my road. What was going on? Hell, if I know, dude, I got shot. I've been laid up in the bed for <laughs> six months. You know, I don't know. But they expect that the public expects that uh, some of your closer friends and family will expect it. So take care of yourselves to take care of the friends and the family that you have now. So and Absolutely. I'll just leave it at that. Absolutely. You know, I, I'd just like to add one thing here. You know, uh, uh, the way management, the way law enforcement treats their people once they're involved in a critical incident can, can actually create the post-traumatic stress injury, not, not the incident itself. So I was, I was doing a, uh, I was doing a speaking engagement to a, a, a state's chiefs association. And I asked him this question. I said, show of hands, how many people in this room place their officers on administrative leave when they commit acts of misconduct and corruption? And everybody raised their hand. I said, okay, who in this room places their officers on administrative leave when they're involved in a shooting or a critical incident? And you could tell they were like looking at each other and they were like doing this because they knew where I was going to go. If we could, if we could unify just enough to have the law enforcement agencies in this country change that stupid phrase to critical incident leave, we could right, right there have a positive effect on our cops across the country by something as simple as as that because when you perceive you you read that in the newspaper he was placed on admin leave what is the what are the connotations there yeah yeah so so i throw this out to everybody that's watching this suggest that to your chain of command many of them will just tell you to go piss up a rope but you never know somebody may say you know what that's a good idea let's let's consider that that's yeah. good You know, one thing I just want to add on that kind of same note as far as how we term things or label things, I think simply, a, you know, changing and addressing post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress injury or even just post-traumatic stress, it makes a big difference because the word disorder has a very negative connotation. It makes you feel powerless, like there's something that you can't do about it. You're just stuck with it. And the fact is that post-traumatic stress is an injury, you know, repeated trauma causes a chemical change, a physical change to the human brain. And we all know that first responders get bad knees, they get bad shoulders, they get bad backs. And what do we do? We get injections, we go to physical therapy, maybe we have surgery, we rehab, you know, we get better. Well, the same thing happens with a mental injury. There's lots of things that you can do to get better and come out the other side of this. And we need to start looking at post-traumatic stress, just like we look at our physical injuries and how we treat our people you're 100 percent correct yeah. we should just we should universally change that designation to ptsi all the absolutely. time yeah absolutely and the only thing i would add i mean 
is everybody on this panel and for those who might be watching uh, are going through something. Everybody on this panel has been through hell, their own personal stories. And I tell people all the time, you are one special person. People love you. You're cared about. You have a place. Your children love you, but your problems aren't unique. There's so many people that have come before you that have struggled with the same problems. Well, I, you know, I'm going through a divorce. Okay. I went through a divorce. I, I have problems with alcohol. Okay. I have problems with alcohol. I'm struggling mentally. I'm not trying to discount what you're going through right now because I've been there. Everybody on this panel has, but there are problems out there are, you know, the same problems that millions of, of others have encountered. And there is resources out there. There is help out there for you. You just got to keep going forward and believing in yourself and surrounding yourself with people that are going to pump you up and support you then bring you down. Well, gentlemen, I think uh, it's that time we should do uh, one more trip around the horn. I'll give you a chance to, uh, to give your last thoughts on this. I will ask you once we're done, um, obviously I'm just going to do a close off thing for everybody here watching. Uh, if you can stick around for a quick AAR, that would be amazing. Um, but uh, Randy, brother, any last thoughts on, uh, on our conversation today? Well, you know, this this is a really important conversation that we had today. I'm so glad that uh, you afforded me the opportunity to be here and to, and to show our film and uh, the, the, all the other panelists here that, that, uh, that gave their, their uh, viewpoints on it, on this incredibly life-saving topic. And, and uh, you know, the fact that you have the platform that you do, sharing it with, uh, with my organization, with Wounded Blue and myself, um, I'm very, very grateful, and I look forward to working with together with everybody else that's on this panel um, to improve the lives of, of all officers, including injured and disabled officers. Absolutely, brother. That's awesome. Mike? I just want anybody that's watching this or listening to this to know that you're not alone. You know, if you're struggling, suffering in silence – know that there are a tremendous amount of resources out there and there is hope. And I'm living proof. Everyone on this panel is living proof that you can come out the other side of this and have a whole new life. So if you are struggling, just please raise your hand and get that help that you need. Pat. Again, blessed to be here, brother. Thank you for the invite. These amazing uh, panelist on the show, Randy, amazing film, brother. Any way I can help you get that out more, I'd be happy to. And kind of riding the coattails of Mike a little bit, you know, if you are struggling, that's the hardest point is making that phone call, but you can do it. You just got to make that phone call, ask for help, and there's going to be plenty of support uh, along the way, believe it or not. Some, some might not support you, but an overwhelming majority will support you so make that call you shouldn't do it you shouldn't suffer in silence well said last but not least steve go ahead brother yes sir thank you well first of all uh thanks to uh all the panelists uh what a great conversation we've had today uh it really was uh, a good uh understanding between so many different uh guys that have been there and done that. Uh, I, I want to say that it's extremely important, not just that we got together and had this conversation, but it was hosted uh, on your summit because uh, to my to my knowledge, uh, you're one of the first ones or you have always been one of the ones that steps up. And being a younger guy, because you don't have this yet, you don't have the gray going on, <laughs> but uh, being a younger guy that understands that and and knows the importance and understands the mission of what needs to happen here to keep our first responders well rounded, uh, it couldn't get any better. Couldn't be any better. So again, Randy, thank you, Michael, thank you, Pat, uh, thank you, thank and you, uh, and. Uh, Last but not least, thanks, Adam. I appreciate you uh, having me on uh, with this summit. So I appreciate that. Absolutely, brother. And I'm looking forward to, uh, I mean, there's going to be lots of opportunities coming up in 2023. I know there's a few spots where we're already, we, uh, we already know we're going to be getting together um, at other conferences and different events. So uh, looking forward to that. And so if I can just ask you guys to stick around for a brief second, um, as we say goodbye here to everybody, if you are still watching this and you've been joining us for this round table, thank you. 
um, for, for your support. And thank you for being here and investing in yourself. Um, these are tough conversations to have, but it, they're important that we have them. We have to give a voice to this. And, um, and now you're part of that. So please don't let the end of this session in the next 30 seconds or so be the end of this. Continue this conversation. Continue it with your family. Continue it with your friends. Continue it with your agencies and departments. The more we talk about it, the more impact that we can have. Um, and so I, again, want to say huge thank you to our friends at Blue Help and Steve. Um, it's an amazing organization. Go to bluehelp.org. You can check them out. And like I said, we are running our I Got Your Six campaign this year. All of the profit goes back to Blue Help. So these shirts, um, we're probably only going to be um, selling them probably until the end of December. And so if you want to get your hands on one, make sure to click the links. Um, they're going to be below in this video after we're done and all that kind of stuff. So check those out. Um, you're going to be, uh, you're going to enjoy them. I promise. And so with that being said, um, that wraps up this live round table here today on Wednesday, the third day of our 2022 ILET summit coming up tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. We have a conversation on the future of instructor development. Um, it's going to be sponsored by our friends at Vertra. Uh, this is going to be a conversation. If you are a trainer or instructor in the public safety sphere, you are not going to want to miss this talk, believe me. And so looking forward to that. With that being said, thank you again for joining us here at the ILET Summit. If you haven't already registered, go to iletsummit.com. You get direct access and get access to all of the amazing training that we have available this week. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, next time. So stay safe and uh, be well. Thank <laughs> you.